Welcome to the Athlete's Compass Podcast, your North Star for mastering endurance training and holistic health. Join us each week as renowned sports scientist and founder of Athletica.ai, Paul Larson, along with athlete, coach, and sports scientist Mariana Rakai, and coach and cyclist Paul Warlowski, guide you through the maze of often confusing training principles. Make sure your compass is ready. Class is now in session. Hello and welcome to the Athletes Compass Podcast, where we navigate training, fitness, and health for everyday athletes. Today, today we are talking about nutrition, and we are accepting that we're going to get possibly some grief for these episodes because the subject of nutrition has been changing so much in the past decade, and we are learning so much more lately about what really does work for endurance athletes to improve their performance and health. And sometimes change is controversial. So Paul and Mariana, we're purposely stepping on some landmines today to talk about what works nutrition because it gets confusing because literally people tell us to train fasted or without eating and others tell us to consume as much carbohydrate as possible. So we have both ends of that spectrum, but surely the truth lies somewhere in between someplace along that continuum. Both of you are proponents of a low-carb, high-fat diet for everyday endurance athletes. So let's focus on that first. Um, This week, we're going to focus on uh, explaining the value of that kind of nutrition of the low-carbohydrate, high-fat diet. And next week, we'll get specific on coaching me, because I don't really know what I'm doing, on how I should adapt my diet. So these are going to be epic and great episodes. Let's start. Explain for us, please, the two of you, for the everyday athletes, what are the basic principles behind the low-carbohydrate, high-fat diet and its intended effects on the athlete's body and their performance? Well, I just want to, I just want to start by saying that, you know, we probably, we might have lost like uh, half of our audience. They might have just like, you know, switched <laughs> to a different, a different podcast after, uh, after you mentioned that Marianne and, and Paul are, 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 you know, advocates of a an LCHF, a low carb, high fat diet. Um, but let me let me just kind of explain first of all why it is a little bit controversial. Um, it, it's going to be controversial these topics because everyone out there is an expert. Everyone's got their own context. Um, we're all experts because we all eat, so we all have our own experience, and we all, you know, that's that. Everyone out has their own kind of bias. It, it's very similar to politics and religion um, because you know every, everyone will have their own mindset and belief in these sorts of items um, and we all feel that our our stance is is the right one so with that being said it is it's it's a, it is nice to look at different viewpoints and especially when we're concerned about uh, the sport of you know endurance sports in general that's that's generally what we focus on in athletica it's in you know we need to be taking a you know a scientific process uh, a reverse engineering analysis of you know what is it that's going to help our performance at the end of the day and maybe even helping our health and uh, and recovery that's that's certainly um, of relevance as well and yeah, I guess to, to 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 finally get to your question, Paul. You, you you know, you said what are some of the principles of uh, of of having a lower carbohydrate than a than a higher amount? Well, maybe actually, you want to. I want to flip it. Actually, let's start with. I want to flip it and, and start. Well, what's the principles of the high carb uh, diet first? And the you know because this is where I started. Um, and sorry to be robbing the microphone here, but I, I started with high carb stuff, and I was I actually invented an app called Neverbong, and um, we spent a lot of money into this into this um, this app called Neverbong, and it was looking at optimizing how much carbs and gels and sugar that you should take on in any any event. Um, so that you could kind of, you know, calculate it out and push out, um, you know, your your amounts to, you know, uh, 90 grams per hour. So I was really looking at helping to optimize. Now, 
the that switched for me when uh, I realized that that was probably not the science I wanted because the, the, if you're taking that mindset, you're all about carbohydrates, which are the it's like the gasoline. You're like you know you're when you're taking on carbohydrates, you're you're putting gasoline in your engine, right? You're uh, like kerosene over top of it, and um, that's that's great. That's a hot. That's a fast fuel. Burns super hot, but um, it can burn out rather quickly and doesn't all isn't always the best fuel for the long go and what do we do when we are in ultra long kind of distance events whether it's you know grand fondo cycling uh or it is you know 70.3 or ironman or ultra marathons you really want to have the the lower end the the ability to burn fat dialed in and you don't just have to do that with training you can also get an extra leverage with uh, if you if you know how to move the levers with your nutrition and that includes not even what you eat but also the timing of when you eat those sorts of things as well so um i've spoken a lot and i and there's so much more but maybe i'll just pause there so i don't rob the whole mic but uh and mariana do you want to add anything how ironic never bunk Yes. Yeah. I know. Uh, so you were trying not to bunk until you found a way to like push the bunk. Yeah. What is what is bonking for for the listener? Yeah. yeah. Let's let's what, let's what talk about What kind of what bunking. kind of bonking are we talking about? <laughs> you know, like people talk about hitting the wall or, or bonking, go. just like straight, like don't have any energy, motivation. Yeah. Like for example, after thirty k marathon yeah. running like motivation to cross the finish line is high yeah. but you just can't bring yourself to run any faster and yeah. oftentimes you end up walking that's bonking i can remember my worst bonk <laughs> <laughs> and that yeah. was well i remember i was i was a young i was a young triathlete and um i remember uh, being out for you know it was a monster monster ride but for whatever reason, I was just like, I was almost, almost came off my bike. I was, it was so bad. Like there was so little energy in my, in my, in my brain, in my mind that, um, yeah, I think I did. I laid over, uh, on, in the grass and I was wondering, can I get some nutrients out of this grass as I lay there? <laughs> it was that bad. So those of us that have experienced this know how bad this you know, hitting the wall can get. Um, so yeah, this is, you know, and, and I had no more food on me. So it was just like, I was lost out there in the, in the farm fields in uh, pit meadows around, Van, you know, Van, around Vancouver where I used to train. So anyways, but uh, so it can get really bad. Um, what's interesting is it doesn't have to be that way. And this is where we'll, where we'll get to, uh, but you have to do a few things first. So you talked about, some of the things that are a challenge with the carbohydrates, maybe we should go there first. What are some of the issues with the high carbohydrate, low fat diet that, you know, honestly, and you know this, that that's kind of the current way of thinking of that's what, you know, I see articles about the pros, you know, trying to get 120 grams or more into their bodies, you know, 120 grams an hour. That is a lot of carbohydrate. So what is what is wrong with that way of thinking for the everyday athletes? Yes. Well, you know, hey, th these guys are doing that. So, you know, before we, uh, yeah, before we say it, it's not possible, we, you know, we shouldn't, you know, we, we know it's possible. So you can go that way. But it doesn't work really well for everyone. And there's some fundamental principles that we should, take on board first before when we sort of step back and, and try to figure out as an individual, what's, what's going to work for me? Well, you know, you're, you're an individual listening to this. You're going to have, when you take on your carbohydrate or your sugar, you have to have a, what's called an insulin response, right? Insulin is the primary and central hormone that is produced by your pancreas and its job is to stabilize your blood glucose and to bring the glucose into 
the cells that need it, the muscle cells predominantly. And um, that's that um, insulin rises in proportion to the level of carbohydrate or sugar that you that you pull into your into your body. And herein lies potentially the problem because many of many of us have heard of this problem. And it's it's called insulin resistance. So you can be resistant to any hormone or any substance, but when you get a lot of insulin all the time, if you're all, for example, if you're always having carbohydrate, you've got to always have have insulin. Generally, generally speaking, um, there's a there's another mechanism that causes your basically the the cells of your muscles to open up and um, and, and take on the, the the glucose. So that is separate from the insulin. But in general, insulin is the primary lock and key sort of mechanism. You got to have insulin present for the lock to be open and for glucose to to come to come into the cell. But the, um, like so many other different things, if you're always hitting the key, if the keys are all over the place, um, the the cell isn't as you know. Uh, good at responding to that and opening over time, and you need more and more and more and more, and that's what that's the vicious cycle that you wind up having, and that eventually drives you into type two diabetes. You become officially insulin resistant, and we know this actually. This goes right to you, the athlete that's listening. And um, there are so many athletes, sadly, that we have seen that we've worked with in the Olympic programs in New Zealand and Australia. And we look at them now and sadly, they are not what you would expect of a lifelong athlete. They've finished their careers and these are individuals that have won Olympic gold medals and they are now overweight um, and they have chronic illness. And you know, we, I can't say that the practices that they were doing when they were young were leading to that, but it, it, it certainly could be the case. So this definitely has, um, it has relevance to your longevity, to your, to your health. Um, and that's what we, we, we also want to optimize that it, with, um, with what we're trying to do here with Athletica. So um, yeah, insulin is the primary problem with your, when you're always hitting it, hitting your body with carbohydrates. So how do we know that we are insulin resistant? How, how, you know, what, what are some, what are some ways that we can figure that out? So you will know if you're and thanks for asking that. It's a great question. Uh, and I would think, you know, a lot of my education, I revert to the, the great Dr. Phil Maftone, who's written chapter seven for us in, in hit science and the nutrition chapter. And, um, you know, he, he says the key thing that you will know if you are insulin insulin resistant is you'll start to be what he terms over fat. And um, there's no shame in the word, but you just have more, you're carrying around more fat than you know is ideal. And typically you're also carrying that fat in your um, uh, abdominal region for some reason, um, most of that, um, most most times when you're over fat, the body tends to store it in the in the abdominal region. So that's that tends to be where it um, where it sits. So you'll all of a sudden have a waist size that may might be inappropriate relative to 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 what's ideal, right? So um, and I think he's there's some formula as well that that Phil uh, um, purports as well that you know it's something like you want to be you want to have your waist size um, under fifty percent under fifty percent of your height. That's right. Thank thanks, okay. Mariana. Exactly. So if you as long as you yeah, that's how you can kind of sort of self assess whether you're you're you know you've potentially got some of that going on um other other means you're you're probably you almost know when you don't respond well to carbohydrate foods right like you kind of if you're always hungry that's definitely so uh that's definitely something so if you're always hungry like in other words a meal with carbohydrate really just isn't hitting the you know it's hardly hitting the sides <laughs> it's what we would sort of say and uh like you know like you just it's not satiating. 
um, that's 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 one might be one thing that that also tells you that you might be a little bit insulin resistant, and that's because you know in, insulin is. Um, its job is to get that that fuel inside the body. It's an anabolic hormone. So all of a sudden, if you're eating and you're not getting, you know, that the if it's not really doing the job, well, then you're 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 insulin resistant. It means you're always going to have to eat to to get to the the hunger level. Um, you're always going to be hungry. So if that you're always hungry, that's that's a classic an other sign that you might be potentially insulin resistant, and you might want to switch up the the fuel sources that you're having, um, the overfat, in the the hunger, um, looking your looking in the mirror, uh, really really simple, but it just actually looking in the mirror is another one, and um, I think those are probably the big ones. Maybe I can jump in here and tell my experience. I was training for full Ironman, and as the current sports nutrition advice goes, I was trying to feed myself with, uh, you know, uh, carbs during my rides. I would get into like living in Dubai, we, we would have this beautiful bike track that I miss. <laughs> uh, but around 100 Ks in, I would have to stop and drink a Coke or Pepsi and eat an ice cream and flush it down with coffee to just like energize myself to go further <laughs> while also my sports bar there would be grapes and uh jelly beans and gummy bears uh sandwiches it was just like eating fest while i was riding my bike buffet <laughs> buffet yeah as it goes <laughs> and and you know like it's hot it's humid you need more carbs you need more energy you know, so I would just eat and before I ride, it would be a breakfast, you know, oatmeal, very carb heavy. And during the rides, I would start like really feeling fatigued and like I can't keep up my power. This went on like months. So it wasn't that I was in fit. Um, but then after the rides, I would just be so tired that I just wanted to watch Netflix on the couch. Um, and some days I had to, I just didn't have any energy. And I started having like this visual, like impairments during the ride, some of the long, long rides, like I would have a hard time just, you know, figuring out where I'm going. And yeah, I started to gain weight, especially around belly and just wasn't feeling good. Granted, some of this was probably associated that I pushed a little bit too far, but my high carb diet didn't uh, help. I mean, Mariana, the, the key thing is that Mariana added a fourth point on 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 another uh, a signal that you might be insulin resistant, and the fourth one there is the fact that you're you've got like a chronic fatigue after your 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 training now we're all we're often all always tired and stuff after our training but there there is there is kind of a difference so um it, you don't have to be that that tired um mariana's smiling and uh so i know she knows this right like there's a yeah you don't have to be sitting on the couch all the rest of the day kind of thing and if you have to do that you might be you know you might be partly in, insulin resistant your fuel sources might be the reason and why because your fat, your your um, your flow of energy coming out from your your fat cells is probably just not not optimized, and uh, and so yeah, so you just always sort of feel low low with energy, and you know that's and you don't want that as a high performer. Most people listening to this are they're high performers, right? So you don't you've you've got a it's more than just uh, your sport and all these sorts of things. You're performing in your work as well, and um, and so. Having a, a, a steady stream of energy throughout your day is something that you probably would value. I know you value. Yeah, absolutely. Like cognitive capability was very low. Like after lunch, train in the morning after lunch, it was always a nap time because I just couldn't, I couldn't do anything. I was just so tired all the time. And it's, you want to be present with your family and your friends and in your work. And if you always 
just fatigued. It's it's not a way to be. So what does the current research say about the efficacy of this low carb, high fat diet for performance and for and for health? I mean, how how does it how is it actually working for people? Yeah, it's really it's really mixed, I think, Paul. Uh, and this is why you you, you started, re, you know, reminding us that this is a bit of a you know landmine sort of field, right? Like this is um, you, you're going to see different sources telling you different things. Um, and w- one thing I will say is that this comes d- directly from. Phil Maftone in our in our course it doesn't like all carbs are not bad all fats not bad you can find bad sources of fat and you can find find bad sources of carbs which is is just sugar right and and same probably same with protein too right protein can be, and meat sources can be ultra processed At the end of the day um, the the main thing we want is is sort of this uh, slow release of fuel into the body and uh, and that can be done usually you know yeah, that, that can be done a bunch of different ways if you are insulin resistant you, an, an ideal strategy is to probably take away the thing first that's making you insulin resistant and that's usually excessive carbohydrates so there's almost kind of this uh, progressive approach if you want to change things and if you are you know if any of this these symptoms are resonating with you the listener you might want to go through a phase where you're you know really removing the the key source that's causing insulin to to be pushed and that's most of the carbohydrates first of all sugar but then you know secondary a lot of the the carbohydrate sources and we're, we're you know we're talking things like your you know your pastas your uh your rice and potatoes your bread um things you know gluten is probably not your not your friend um you know you keep them keep uh be mindful of your um your lactose levels as well those are when when those items are lowered or reduced or eliminated there's usually good things that are kind of around the corner and then there's a big difference between you know a gel that you're cracking versus an apple right like um a, an apple is probably going to be very slow to release that its glucose into this into the um into the the system and so you know there's they're completely sort of they're both carbohydrates but one is a natural form versus the other so as a general general approach whatever you're consuming the more it can come from mother nature whether it's carbohydrate fat or or protein the less processed it is the better and um just take take all the you know um low carb versus high carb religion out of it it's just like you know if you can kind of go go back to fundamentals there with with uh with what mother nature kind of put in front of you then that's you're going to be absolutely um doing doing really really well but um but yeah there can be sort of this 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 process um this emphasis in the beginning if you're just starting out on this process and you might want to lower the lower the carb angle first if you're if you're on what would be called like a traditional high carb uh diet and i and i think there's lots of misconception about the whole uh low carb high fat diet ketogenic diet um and a lot of people talk about oh you should not restrict anything you should be eating um anything you want and i don't believe in restriction at all but i also think that um like you say paul we need to go back a couple of decades when we didn't go into grocery store to get like a 10 pack of uh, bars that are full of sugar. You can't even find oatmeal without added sugar in the store. (laughs) You know, you know, like low carb, I don't like I'm, I'm, I'm eating low carb, but I don't count my calories. I don't track my macros. I'm eating, you know, all colors 
that's what I try to do. I try to eat all colors and I did uh, a period of time where I tracked everything and I learned what everything, like how many carbs does, you know, red onion have. And so I educated my myself for a while to understand like what um, food items have lots of carbs in them. Uh, and then I just choose like you said, if I can pull it out of the um, out of the ground, it's good. Or chase it down, it's good. And I, you know, when I go to grocery store, I try to uh, avoid the middle aisles. So th those are like my principles. But I think a lot of people don't understand that low carb is not the like, same as keto. And there's like, I'm not restricting anything. I'm just eating really healthy. Yeah, for sure. And here's the thing is if you are an athlete uh, and you're doing a bunch of training and you're um, and and you're eating like Mariana sort of Mariana says, you wind up you don't even realize it, but you wind up being a keto athlete anyways, because you're always burning calories and you're you wind up keeping your insulin level low just just through the combination of the exercise and then the healthy eating. And, and then, so you get the same benefit. So there's a, just, to, just to be clear, listener, there are a bunch of studies uh, that show the benefits of a ketogenic diet. And it's um, like, it, it's used, here's a, you know, here's one of my key books from, from Tim, right? Like it's, it's a, it's an actual clinical like method, right? Of, of, uh, of reversing diabetes in, um, in individuals, right? So there's a whole bunch of bunch of benefits that from from cell signaling and you know telling your cells to be younger, um, from the energetic properties of the of the ketones themselves. Ketones are what's produced when you only have fat av available, and your liver basically converts them into something that can be taken in up taken up by your brain, because you can imagine that um, you know we didn't. In the, you know, I guess the evolutionary times, if we didn't have sugar available, your brain had, it, your brain, um, it needs, it can only process glucose. So it had to invent something else that, um, that it could process and ketones were what it invented, where it basically, it takes your fat stores, it rips them apart and it converts them to three different ketones that can be taken up by your brain. And it just so happens that when your brain is taking up those ketones, you're actually even more alert and energetic. They actually provide more energy per unit of, of um, uh, per, uh, per unit of ATP. They, like they give you give you more um, bang for buck ultimately, and um, y the more free energy ultimately. So yeah, you get those same benefits is what I was saying, even by just having an exercise and a, and a, and a healthy diet kind of program. Um, so, and this is why actually athletes are primed to be able to adapt to this diet uh, so much more than, than, a, than a sedentary individual. Athletes find this actually quite easy and they adapt quite quickly to uh, a lower carb diet. They can do this a lot easier than say someone that's um, that's very sedentary and very insulin resistant, um, because they're, that? they're, because they're, they're already there. They, like they're, they're halfway there already. They're in general, um, because of their exercise and the fact that exercise is always keeping their insulin levels generally lower than a person who's sedentary, the, you know, um, it doesn't take them too long to, to change over that fuel source. And, um, because that's what, that's the whole purpose of the, endurance training. If you're on Athletica, your aerobic rides, typically what you're trying to do in this is build your ability to burn fat as a fuel. And, um, and that's, and, and you do that by burning more fat and going longer. But here's the, here's the twist is that you actually don't have to go as long and as hard to get the same sort of bang for buck if you can pull the nutrition lever as well. So you can, you know, and, and Dan Plews talks about this all the time, right? Like he compares, uh, you know, the typical age group or professional, you know, the top age group or professional Ironman triathlete who are training towards 
30 and 35 hours per week. Well, you can back that up basically by 10 hours and get the same, the same benefit, but train 10 hours less if you simply know how to, how to move the nutrition uh, lever as well. You can, you can, and, and train smarter as well. You know, ultimately a lot of the, the, the sessions that we, that we program in Athletica. So, um, so yeah, so it's, you, you don't have to go out there and just smash yourself for 35 hours to, to, um, to get these aerobic benefits. You can do it also with, um, with moving the nutrition needle. Yeah. And if a listener doesn't know fat, one gram of fat has nine, nine kilocalories instead of, uh, one gram of carbs, which contains four mm. kilocalories. So there's like over double as much energy per gram. Yeah. And that's, and that's a really great point. And we, we, we sort of should have let off with that, but, um, the other important point is um, the amount that's stored on us. So hmm. in a lean individual, the amount of fat that's stored on us is something like 200,000 kilocalories of energy, which is about enough energy. Um, I'm in British Columbia. So if you put a gun to my head, I could march up to Mark who's in Palm Springs right now. So, uh, you know, that's how far, I, that's how much fat I've got in, in my relatively lean body. But I've only got 2,000 kilo, kilocalories or, you know, 350 to, to 400 grams of carbohydrate in my liver and, and, uh, and muscle stores. I can't go very far on that. It's, it's, it's only going to take me two hours and I'm going to be done. So, um, you know, it's, it's just uh, the, the level of difference in terms of stored um, stored energy on the body is so heavily favored in, in, in that of fat. If you can only learn how to open the, um, you know, the, the gas hose to allow that energy to come out of your fat storage, um, amazing things happen such as, you know, in some of my professional triathletes that I train where, they, they ride eight hours fasted. And that sounds crazy and nuts. And I don't recommend that the listener does that if they've never, you know, worked up to that. But that's what these, these guys wind up doing. And that's the capacity of their ability to reach in there. And here's the crazy thing. I know you guys will know that, that I'm not crazy, but they'll, they'll do this and they'll say they got better um, after the back half, it got a lot easier in the back half. Yeah. Once I hit four hours, it was just, it really felt good. <laughs> yeah, just, it, anyways, it, it's crazy. It, it sounds crazy, but I've witnessed that. So, so many times it, it's like, almost like elevated, like you, it's kind of like a euphoria almost. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but a lot of the critics about low carb, they say that it's very restrictive diet and, um, you end up in a low energy availability state or, you know, reds and put yourself in a hole. What do you, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah. I, I just don't understand that. Here is the thing, and you hear me that harping on about this one, Mariana, is that, you know, I never want you to to be hungry, right? When I was initially coaching this, if you're hungry, you eat, you find something to eat, but try to find something that's healthy to eat. So um, I'm all for the concept that you said before, where you just, you know, you don't restrict yourself, like you, you, you know, maybe restrict yourself from sugar, that you know is going to be harmful and, and causing the insulin spikes. But don't restrict yourself from healthy foods. You can have as much healthy foods as you want. And in fact, you should be. Like, so listen to that apostat in your, in, your, in your mind and feed it because your cells need that energy. Um, I don't, to me, the, the, the whole REDS uh, phenomenon, reduced energy deficiency syndrome, it doesn't kind of make sense because it, it, to me, it, it it, it, it suggests, again, that insulin is blocking your ability to release energy from your fat cells. That's, you know, insulin, anabolic hormone, and it needs to be lowered, in my mind, so that the fat cells, the energy kind of comes out. I, 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 I don't believe we should be restricting. Um, I don't think we've totally... 
um, figured out where red sort of sits sits in this whole thing yet. Um, I think there's other contextual issues that might be confounding our, our ability to kind of get this one right. But uh, I'm all about bringing on the nutrients on board, never restricting those, the, the good nutrients that, that we need. And it is a problem if we're restricting. But we don't restrict on our diet, do we? No. And, and you said something that I think it's uh, very important here, and that's restricting sugar. Our brains are addicted to sugar. It loves it, right? So going from eating whatever and jelly beans and <laughs> jelly beans, Coke during the ride. Oh yeah, my brain loved it. Yay, I can have a Coke and <laughs> not feel bad about it. But emotions and feelings are so connected to what we eat. Not everybody, but we have our own relationships with, with food, like when we're feeling down or we're feeling bad, we go and grab ice cream or whatever our go-to is. Um, for some people, it might be alcohol, right? Um, so, and oftentimes we grow up restricting, you know, what we eat. And as a female, we often restrict what we eat because we want to be lean and we want to be skinny which is not a way to go if you're an athlete by the way like restriction um to me the hardest part was mentally and not take that snack before a ride you know like right before a ride or oh, i'm going for a long ride i need to fuel myself i need to eat um even though i wasn't hungry but it was just something that it was so ingrained in my habits to, to do. And I remember the first like fasted runs, it was only 30 minutes. And then I was like super hungry. <laughs> so I would go and have a banana with me. So I was just eat the banana after I got so hungry that I had to yeah, have something. But then they increased to two hours. I'm like, oh, this, this is actually pretty good. After two hours, it was like, three hours and slowly it got me up to six and a half hours and just freaking amazing. freaking amazing but then in the next thing was not fueling for those high in interval sessions so because i wanted to so i would have a um 30 30s in the plan mid-morning a few hours after breakfast normally i would have grabbed a banana or something and uh, Paul, you said, no, stay curious. Uh, you don't need that. So I went and did my 3030s without that little extra fuel. And my performance didn't, you know, um, decline just because I didn't take that banana, you know, 15 minutes before or whatnot. So I think mentally because we've been bombarded with all these you need to eat 120 grams of sugar on your training rides we we've just accustomed to believe all that when we really need to stay curious and explore what our body can work with and work best and i just have to tell recovery after you know these long runs i'm my marathon is coming up this week um first of all i was not able to run long runs before just recently um and now i did like 30 k weekends back to back and i recover from them it's unbelievable not just the you know the the runs itself but just a few days after i'm fine which is, to me, it's just new and pretty awesome. So you, so for long workouts, for intensity workouts, don't we need carbohydrate to fuel that kind of intensity? Because the there's just not enough energy in fat to make that happen. Well, that's what we've been told, Paul. That's what we've been told. But that's not 
necessarily the case if you are fat adapted versus carb adapted athlete. If you're a fat adapted athlete, you will use a lot more fat to do either of those two activities you described, whether it's high intensity work or long duration work. Um, because you, you go at, you go at your exercise a different way. And, um, you know, something called the crossover point with exercise is delayed in the high fat athlete. The high fat athlete will have, yeah, this, they'll, they'll hold on, they'll continue to burn fat as a fuel longer into the high, higher exercise intensity bands, even, you know, right up to 90% of, of VO2 max, so right at your highest exercise intensity, like even when you're doing long intervals, say, for example, VO2 max intervals, you're, you're, you're doing those burning, you know, probably up to 50% fat for those where, um, yeah, we haven't thought that that was possible in the past, but, um, you know, the, data supports that it that it actually is and um you know we, we uh, it's again this is kind of this will be new for for lots of people but that's that's uh yeah a lot of the studies that are that are coming through now are showing that we're we can burn fat up to uh you know 1.7 1.8 grams per minute which are really high levels uh that never thought possible compared to compared to the past after you know you just need a, a relatively long adaptation period um, and you can just imagine the the adapt the the benefits of being able to do that means doesn't mean you're not going to use carbohydrates but you're holding on to them and you're storing them so much better and they're um, it means you have full access to the the stored fat on your on your body and it means that you um, yeah it, it means you can still um, you know, leverage carbohydrate, um, just, uh, you know, softer. Um, you don't have to completely rely on it ultimately for, for those high intensity exercises or the long duration exercises. You, yeah, you can, and it's, you know, for training, you hardly need it. And then even for the, the race itself, you just need a, you know, you don't need 120 grams per hour. You probably get by quite well with, you know, Maybe, you know, it's individual, maybe it's 60 grams per, per hour, but, at, um, you know, and there's some more data that's needed in this. I had Tim Noakes on my podcast, the Training Science Podcast, and he said, you know, we're working on this hypothesis, but all the data that he says that he's seen supports the fact that you really, who, irrespective of who you are, you simply need to... Uh, hold on to a homeostatic or normal level of blood glucose. However you do that, as long as your blood glucose level isn't falling during exercise, you are going to be able to perform to your max. So if you need 120 grams per, per hour to keep your blood glucose at 5 millimoles normal, then great, and that's what you need. But you might also get away with 50 grams per hour, a low amount if you are a fat-adapted athlete. You're still, you know, even at high exercise intensities like, you know, that you're going at during Ironman, you still might be able to hold that, um, that five millimole normal level of glucose, and that might be optimal for you. So it, as we say time and time again in the Athletes Compass podcast, it really comes back to the individual. So take the politics away. Think about you. How can you, what's working best for you? And, um, and how can, you know, how can you be better? And with the 50 grams an hour, that's still hard to get in 50 grams. If you don't, like, I don't like gels. I can't. Mm. Yeah, that's two, they, that's two they, gels they, an hour. Two yeah, gels an hour too, if you're on the yeah, bike. Yeah, right? uh, and I can't even get in one because they just taste so gross and it makes me feel bad. But I do yeah. do my jelly beans and whatnot. But if you, right. don't, if you don't have to take 120, how much easier practically it is to plan your, your race because you don't have to haul all these gels and packs and stuff them everywhere. <laughs> you know, it's so much easier. 
and then not only for easier from the practicality standpoint, Mariana, but also what causes what the problem with 120 grams per hour. This is what most athletes come to me for, you know, especially professionals who are trying to do these 120 gram per hour uh, pushes. They come to me and they say, I just bloated. Like I just, my stomach was distended. And that's because um, like there's a fermentation process that it, that is required to digest carbohydrate, right? It, it produces gas and it, we just are not all, you know, accustomed to being able to process that much carbohydrate in our gut itself. And a lot of these guys will have dropped out, not for a lack of exercise ability, but for the pain and um, that, that happened in their gut because their the, the gas um, pushed out their gut so much that the pain was too debilitating. And, they, and, you, just, and you see them on the side of the road in Kona and they're just they're walking and they're 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 holding their their gut because they're so they're just feeling so bad and they they just they're they can't they can't handle that much uh, carbohydrate processing. So um, this is again in the low carb situation. You just you you get to a much more manageable amount that the gut can handle and you run free and you run to your ability and that's a beautiful thing. You know, Dr. Noakes, who, who was on your Hit Science podcast, he wrote a paper that we're going to include in the show notes. And he was talking in that paper about how fat adapted athletes are able to use fats at that higher percentage of VO2 max that you were just talking about and possibly extending that crossover point. Could you explain what exactly a fat adapted athlete, what does that mean? Yeah, well, that that means when you look at that crossover point and what we're talking about is, you know, you're going through your progressive exercise intensity, you know, call it a VO2 max test, for example, and you're going, you know, really easy where you're burning lots of fat, everyone's burning lots of fat, but then you move into the middle part and, um, you know, high fat athletes are going to be burning more fat and typically high carb athletes are going to be burning less fat so the, the crossover point then in those two athletes is different. The high fat athlete, they cross over later into burning more carbohydrate. They're holding on to their ability to burn fat longer throughout the progressive exercise intensity. So that's that's what we mean when we're talking about a fat fat adapted athlete. You're able to burn not uh, as is typical 0 0.3 grams per minute, you're now able to burn up to one point, you know, anything from 1.1 up to 1.8 grams per minute of, of fat. Um, and that means, and you're, you're tearing that fat off of your person, your, yourself, and you, the stuff that you're holding on to. Sounds pretty good, right? Like a lot of us want to do that. So that's, that's what, if you're fat adapted, um, you're, you're doing that all the time. You're doing that when you sleep, you're doing that if you're listening to this podcast in any ways, and you're doing that when you exercise as well. So that's, that's what a fat adapted athlete is. You're not getting hungry and reliant on needing to go to the fridge to have that piece of cake that, you know, is sitting in there, right. Um, or whatever. So that's it. Oh, you can make really yummy, you know, keto cake, keto cake, or <laughs> my go-to is some berries with uh, whipped cream and there some cinnamon go. top. There you go. <laughs> Absolutely, you can for sure. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, are there long-term health implications of following this kind of uh, low-carb, high-fat diet? Michael Becker, one of my athletes and a medical doctor, was concerned when we talked about this about increased cholesterol with the higher fat intake. Is there anything to be worried about with cholesterol or with other um, health issues? Yeah, it's a really good point, Paul, and I'm glad you brought it up. Um, you know, if we even go to the very famous Jeff Volek faster study, and just to bring up the, the faster study, basically what Jeff and colleagues did was they, they took uh, high fat athletes and they took high carb athletes and both were ultra, ultra distance runners. They ran them through a bunch of tests in the laboratory. Um, including like one where they ran them on the treadmill for three hours at race pace. 
and um and then but they and they got a full kit of of bloods on these guys both the highs and the and the low carbs and one thing that they did find in the low carb athletes was to your point higher levels of cholesterol um in the the low carb the low carb athletes in other words something about their chronic consumption of fat in the diet you know fat and protein led them to higher levels of cholesterol now begs the question um you know typically is that a problem now typically if we look traditionally to the problem with with cholesterol cholesterol is typically thought to be a marker for heart disease doctors get often a little bit concerned when they see higher levels of cholesterol so first of all we say we don't know um, it and we're we're not completely dismissing the issue, but it is very consistent across the uh, across the board. But you know, um, a few just a few points on the issue. Number one, there's only there. You know, we don't know if there's a causation issue with high levels of cholesterol in the diet or in 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 the blood and an issue for heart disease you know we're talking in athletes right now is when you're looking at these you know incredibly you know gifted athletes um we typically do not see these individuals uh succumbing to heart disease or uh you know heart attacks and these sorts of things um that's not the population that gets these these issues so they could be doing things in different ways nevertheless um uh, and and all of the other you know most of the other studies it's not a causation it's a correlation so there's a relationship between higher levels of cholesterol and heart disease in some of these other uh, larger scale studies that they've done um, there's also different types of cholesterol as well that you know there's um, there's HDLs and LDLs and there's these particle size things that are in those as well um, and and then we should also be really mindful that cholesterol is in all of our cells. It's a very important part um, of of the body, and it's it, you know it, it, there's a real negative connotation on cholesterol itself. But it, it, you know, it got a bad name, and it's actually pretty critical. Like you're not you're not going to survive without cholesterol. So all that kind of um, to be said uh, is um, we'll keep an eye on it. But um, when you look at all the positives that a lower carbohydrate uh, diet has in terms of lowering insulin resistance, lowering the incidence of chronic disease, um, you know, lowering, uh, you know, your, your level of di diabetes um, and diabetes risk, I th you know, in my opinion, the pros definitely outweigh any um, any you know high level of cholesterol that you might attain in in going through this, um, but nevertheless mindful, and we keep an eye on this on this uh, this outlying um, marker that that your your doctor friend makes a good point on. What about differences between um, you know sex or aging athlete? It seems like. The younger the athlete, the more carbs they can t take and get away with, maybe. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. So, uh, and I put my hand up. So I, w I lived the high carb life as a young, young athlete, uh, and um, you know, I, even when I look to my what my daughter eats as well, right, and and her friends, like it's it's incredible, the amaze, you know, how well they can consume. Uh, carbohydrate. And there might be even something there that's important to be able to take on a lot of carbohydrate at those uh, young ages when you're when you're growing rapidly, right? So, um, but the and I'm just speaking anecdotally, but it, it does seem like there is this resistance to to insulin that's that's secreted as as you age, and and um, the older you get, the harder you have a harder time you have um, keeping yourself at a weight that you might might want to might want to be at and uh so yeah there's definitely an, a an aging component there where that sits where that lies is so individual so uh and a sex difference um i you know i think uh I i'm i'm actually not too sure like um yeah i would uh you know i think i think it's more more an individual sort of thing but um yeah, like uh, any any thoughts on that, Mariana? 
I hear a lot of uh, talk, especially on social media, that women should not do low carb. We need more carbs. I have not been able to wrap my head around that because women are better fat burners already. Um, And sex hormones, like hormones, you need energy and you need fat to, you know, produce hormones, correct? Yeah, absolutely. Right. And that, that actually goes back to, that was another point I was going to make on Paul's point on the cholesterol. So cholesterol is the backbone of key uh, sex hormones, sex, sex steroid hormones, like, like estrogen and testosterone. So again, there's another key thing that you need that for. So again, more support for, um, you know, a low carb diet, uh, well-formulated low, low carbohydrate diet as well. So, and, and yeah, and, and I will, I'll say that I just support what you said there, Marianne, as well. It doesn't make, it doesn't make too much sense that there's this backlash against it, against it. women are in general, better fat burners. And there are studies supporting that. Uh, I've trained women yourself, um, many others that have, um, you know, Nicole Walker, I've, I talk about her on um, Taryn's podcast as well. So you know, and she, she was, uh, you know, seventh overall in Ironman Arizona, low carb athlete. So on and on it kind of goes. So I, so I, I haven't noticed uh, an issue personally um, from females. In fact, they, they tend to respond really, really well to, to it. So it's interesting that there is that, that slant going against it um, on social there, media. There is, and I, and I wonder if some of it is based on, I shouldn't generalize, but based on tendencies to restrict our eating. And when we start talking about low carbohydrate diets and the word diet has a negative implications to it. So I wonder if some of that is based on misunderstandings because I like, I I'm doing low carb, but I'm like, I've never eaten more healthy than I'm right now. So I don't understand like what is, what is so bad about it. Honestly, I, I don't know either, Marianne. I think it, it's somehow it's the perception of it that that you're, you know, that, that maybe you're just sitting down with a bowl full of lard. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just I don't know. Sticks of I don't butter know. just ah, yeah, it's right. It's, right. Ah. <laughs> it's a little bit different, but who knows? Yeah, yeah. but yeah. So, so I've I've done amazing. Like I've lost you know when you have three kids and you stretch your belly stretches and then it goes back and then it's you know like you repeat the cycle so at some point you start thinking like okay well I have a belly pouch like I'm never gonna be like I was when I was 30 or under 30 but this you know last six months have totally changed my body composition which I'm super happy and stoked about so it's working for me End of one. Well, that's and that, but that's all that matters, right? So, if uh, someone's still listening to this, it, the only thing that matters <laughs> is you. <laughs> yeah, it really does. Yeah. Yeah. So, figure out what works for you, and um, yeah, if 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 a couple of these things we've we've mentioned here help, then then all the power to it. And if it do, and if you've got more questions, make sure you. Um, you, you ask yeah. them, we've got a great forum and, uh, and we're open to, um, having, um, you know, constructive conversation around these topics as well. Exactly. It's like religion in a way we just need, as you said, uh, you know, we, need, if we strip away all the religion of the different diets, it comes down to eating well, eating what mother nature gave you. And that's really my first takeaway is that a low carb, high fat diet can improve performance and your health. And it's not about restricting necessarily what you eat. I mean, you restrict sugar, restrict processed food, but you eat a really healthy diet. Number two, what we're really focusing on, Paul, as you said this, is that we are looking for a slow release of fuel as energy in our in our workouts. If you are insulin resistance, you want to take away what's making you insulin resistance, and that's a lot of carbs. And so to be, and this is number three, more fat adapted, when we eat more fats, when we eat more healthy fats and eat a better diet, 
we preferentially consume fat as our fuel. And when we eat carbohydrates, our bodies oxidize that glucose from carbohydrate and that becomes our fuel. So it's that choice about what we are using as our fuel. So this is a a huge topic and we've gone on longer than we normally do, but there's so much to get into. When we meet next, Paul and Mariana are going to coach me through the specifics of what this kind of diet might look like because I'm new and I don't really know what I'm doing and I'm I'm ex- I'm experimenting. So that's all for this week. Thank you for listening and join us next week when we get really specific about this kind of um, nutrition you know, on the Athletes Compass podcast. You can help us by asking your questions. I mean, this is going to, I hopefully we get a lot of questions about these episodes in the comments. Uh, like and share the podcast. Give us some five-star reviews. We've been getting some of those and we appreciate that. Uh, engage with us on our social media. And for Mariana Rakai and Dr. Paul Larson, I am Paul Werlowski, and this has been the Athletes, Athletes Compass Podcast. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoyed another episode of the Athletes Compass Podcast, your guiding light through the complex world of training for your endurance sport. For a deeper dive into the science, listen to our companion podcast, the Training Science Podcast, and check out the AI adaptive training platform, athletica.ai. Thanks.